lecture we are going to discuss about the freely self culture uh, you all might be aware about the freely self culture where because it is well standardized if you are ordering the cells from the etcc or some other company and you are getting the cells you you can easily go them in the form of culture plates the so plates like as here you can see these can be the petri dishes these can be the flasks and they are coming in the different different volumes like the 25 cm square 75 cm square these are the 2d uh, culture flask or the 2d culture petri dish this is the petri dish this is a culture flask so you can easily grow your cells once you are getting the cells from any source you can grow the cells in the the cell culture plate there are many pros and one of the major advantage of using this 2d cell culture is the low cost and it is well standardized okay so you will find if you sort of media in it, uh, in atcc different types of flask you can get so it is well standardized so you can easily grow your cells in the 2d cell culture but however there are some disadvantages as well in case of the 2d cell culture. what happened in this 2d cell culture play if you see here these plates are generally okay, these plates are generally being coated with the these are the coated plates so these are either coated with the uh these are generally coated with the extra cellular matrix protein that can be either polydilysine lic uh collagen you can say polydilysine vitrodactyl fibrodactyl we are going to describe it later with the short while but these are the plates which are like we coated with these proteins so this is the extra cellular matrix proteins so the cell are interacting with the cell extra cellular matrix and why this interaction is necessary because once the cells are interacting with the ecm proteins extra cellular matrix proteins there is a signal and that signal is required for the cellular growth for the differentiation for the migration and so on and so and therefore uh, you can see whenever these plates are coming they are having the coating of certain proteins okay. but the only the but the disadvantage of this stack is this that the cells when the cells are growing in this culture class and when you are adding the media in this culture class all the cells are equally exposed to the culture media however this is not the case of in vivo in vivo if you will see cells are not growing on the planar surface they are not equally exposed to the growth media that contains the growth factors okay. so this is the desired one what happened if like the cells all the cells are equally exposed to the growth media so the morphology of the cell it will not give a normal cell morphology and the one one major disadvantage is it will not offer an accurate drug response prediction for example if you have 100 drugs in the and you are testing these drugs in your cells which is having the cells let's say these are the cells you will get out of 100 drugs maybe you will you will get like let's say 90 drugs are showing good response or your cells are sensitive to 90 drugs so you are going to test these 90 drugs in the mice model or you can check in the non human primates or in the ferrets model in the my, uh, in the animal model you are going to test them let's see if this is 90 drug for one drug you will at least take six mice or six animals so how many animals you are going to use you can see 6 into 90 which is 540 mice okay. because, uh, in this you can see and then out of these 540 mice then it will go to the clinical trials and there are high chances that your drug may fail because 
fifty cells. These two D cells, which are very sensitive for these drugs. The human cells, like let's say if you are testing in the human cells, then they may not be sensitive to that drug. Your clinical trial may fail, and therefore the scientists are moving from the two uh, D cell culture to the three D cell culture. The another thing which I want to emphasize is this: scientists have seen the gene and the protein expression. If you find, let's say, if there is a gene, for example, let's say most common gene we can see p53. If you are getting a high expression of these genes in this two D cell culture, you may not get it in the mice model or animal model or in the in vivo culture. So, and that is not uh, based on. Uh, Just a little, uh, just a uh, way. I just want to say that that has come from the scientific literature. Scientists have performed the experiments and they found the cells which are growing in the dairy culture. They are expressing the genes in a different way than the in vivo culture. So these are the major cons, and uh, because of that, the scientists are moving from the two D cell culture to the three D cell. Culture. What we are uh, we understand from this slide is the plates are generally coated with the ECM protein because all the cells are equally exposed to the media. Their morphology will not be uh, similar like the in vivo culture. Will not offer an accurate drug response protection because there are chances that the cells might be sensitive to your drugs when they are equally exposed. But when you are using that drug for the human disease treatment, you will see the human cells may may show the resistance for the same drug. So it will not offer an accurate drug response protection, and your clinical trial may fail. And there is a forced polarity means there are the epithelial cells in the basolateral part that is a forced in case of the two D cell culture, which is not the case of in vivo. So therefore, the scientists are moving from the 2D culture to the 3D cell culture. What is 3D cell culture? If you see here, in the 3D cell culture, there is an increased cell to cell or cell to ECM interaction. Let's first understand what is ECM. So here, as you can see, this is the cell, and this is the extracellular matrix. It composed of Many proteins. For example, you can see here collagen, proteoglycans, laminin, fibronectin, vitronectin, which has not been shown here. So cells are having the receptor. Let's say integrin receptor, and here you can see the integrin receptor is interacting with the laminin, which is a extracellular matrix protein. So laminin and uh, fibronectin and vitronectin, these are the cell adhesion protein. Collagen is providing the structural support to the cell. And elastin is providing the elasticity to the cell. Similarly, the proteoglycans they are helping the cells, such as the heparin sulfate. They are helping the cells in keeping the cells hydrated. Okay, if the cell is not hydrated, then these proteins will help in passing the water inside the cell via osmosis. Then there is a hyaluronic acid that resists the compression of. So let's say that that will provide some sort of mechanical strength. So three D cell culture, they increase the cell to cell to the cell to ECM interaction. In the three D cell culture, the ECM either the cells are forming their ECM by themselves, and if they are doing so, they are forming the spheroid, which is you can see the circular mass of the cells. But You can also provide the platform in which they are having the uh, more cell to ECM interaction. Means the ECM you are providing them artificial. Okay, in this you are providing ECM artificial. So to increase the cell to cell or to the cell to ECM interaction. Okay, and there is one more method which we will discuss later. It is a microfluidics chip-based method. In this, you are providing the media from here. Let's say 
and you are collecting the there is one this is the let's say this is the uh, you can say this is the inlet and let's say this is the outlet okay so you are providing the media here and you are collecting the waste material here. this is the continuous flow process this is the micro fluid so the in, in the step forward system you are providing the platform for the cells to grow in the 3d fashion so that they are not equally exposed to the growth media in the spheroid system the ecm is formed by the cells themselves and again because they are forming the spheroid the inner cells okay, will be hypoxic the outer cells will not be hypoxic inner cells will have less oxygen outer cells will have more oxygen so that is the in vivo okay. so this is a more accurate representation of the in vivo scenario the drug resistance model there is not forced polarity uh, and it reduces the use of animal models so let's say in a 2d culture if you get out 90 drugs to which cells are sensitive in the 3d culture you will get 50 drugs to which the uh, your cells are sensitive and when you are testing these drugs in your animals let's say 50 to 6 you will use 300 animals here you will use how many 540 animals so there is a reduced uses of animal models what are the cons it's a comparatively expensive process complex downstream processing not many 3d cell cultures are high throughput means if you want to test your drugs you have thousands of drugs you can you means uh, it's difficult to test them in the 3D cell culture. There is also challenges in the microscope. So these are the major cons. And when I'm saying the complex downstream processing, maybe you once you are uh, testing these cells and you are adding the drug and you are uh, seeing the observe. If you want to observe any change in the cells, you have to isolate these cells out of these platforms. And from there, you may lose certain types of cells. So there is a complex process because once you are doing the experiment, you will see how the how this uh, how how about the proliferation marker, how about the like the Ki sixty seven is the proliferation marker. You want to see the p fifty three. Then for that you have to isolate the cells, and and that's how it becomes difficult. So processing is quite difficult in comparison to two D culture, which is well standardized. You just have add the trips, and you will get all the cells in this. It is not the case. And also it's not high throughput. Here you have uh, 96 well played, 384 well played. Here you don't have. So uh, high throughput is uh, difficult. But nowadays, as I said, uh, techniques are coming pretty much faster. And scientists are developing so many instruments so that you can get, you can make that 3D cell culture even high throughput. But it's not that common as the 2D cell culture. So in this you can see this is spheroids in which the cell circular mass is there in the scaffold based here you are providing the platform on which cells are growing but then I think all the cells are not equally exposing to the growth media and then the microfluidic sphere there is an inlet and the outlet so you are supplying the material and you are collecting the waste so it's a simultaneous process. Types of 3D culture, as I said, is scaffold based in which you are providing the platform. And these platform could be uh, formed by many materials. It could be ceramics, glasses, polymers and metals. But most common, commonly used material is the polymer. So scientists are using polymers to provide the extracellular matrix in an artificial manner. So polymers could be of two types. Either they can could be natural polymers such as silk, alginate, gelatin, metrigel, collagen, hyaluronic acid. I discussed about this is provide resistance to the cells. The advantage is this that they are having they are providing the excellent biocompatibility because they are isolated from the natural weight, um, so they are highly biocompatible to your cells. But they, the, but they also show the poor mechanical strength. But this is not the case nowadays. There are certain natural polymers which are also providing good mechanical strength. When I am saying mechanical strength, why you need that? 
let's say if you made a uh, scaffold okay and if uh, by using the polymers okay and let's say if you are having some cells in this or some drugs in this and you are injecting these things in the body human body okay? because most of the time the scaffold based methods are used for the tissue they are mainly used for the tissue injection okay so what you are going to do you will put uh, these cells or scaffold based system in the body but let's say if you want to do the bone repair then you will put these scaffold in the bones that they should provide the mechanical strength if they are not having any strength then it is difficult for them to repair the bones so depending on the cells or the system you have to see which polymer you want to use mainly the scaffold based systems are mainly used for the tissue engineering where you want to engineer or repair any body tissue or even plant tissues so there are artificial polymers like polystyrene uh, because these are artificial because they are not being isolated from by the natural forces they are being isolated from the means the key chemical way in the chemical treatment uh, uh, chem means chemically uh, the uh, certain polymers are treated and therefore they are the artificial polymers so for example the polystyrene it is transparent and hence it is suitable for the imaging like the polycaprolactone it is biodegradable similarly the ptrp which is the polytetrafluoroethylene it provides it is it has a desirable mechanical and a thermochemical stability but poor cell adhesiveness is well known fact so the major disadvantage of this is the in vivo biocompatibility is the toxic Voids and the chemicals used in their polymerization. So when you are having polymers which are not being isolated from the natural source and therefore they are artificial polymers because they are being synthesized in the laboratory. So what happened in this case? Because once you are uh, polymerizing these polymers, what happened? You have to use certain parts. Uh, uh, certain sort of uh, solvents and these solvents. could be toxic to the cell so that's what we are saying is a toxic moieties major challenges for in vivo biocompatibility is the toxic moieties because these solvents which you are using for polymerization of these polymers could be toxic and similarly the chemicals used in the polymerization could be toxic so whenever you are using any artificial polymers you have to use certain sort of solvents so there are certain tags which we are not using solvent but most of them the solvents are used and these solvents sometimes are very toxic to the cells so be very careful about it so the major advantage of the natural polymers is the excellent biocompatibility since they have been isolated from the natural sources and the poor mechanical strength however in case of the artificial polymers for their polymerization since certain chemicals or solvents are used and those solvents or chemicals could be toxic to the cell so these are the major challenges for the natural and the artificial polymers so now we discuss about the advantages and the disadvantages of the scaffold based method so advantages like the ph the porosity or the hydrophobicity or the surface area the biological properties like the biocompatibility it could be controlled or it it is customizable okay based on the solvent you are using or how much concentration of the polymer you are using what method you are using based on that it could be controlled so this is the advantage this advantage the major disadvantage of this is that the ecm is artificial you are providing the ecm in a artificial way like we are providing the ecm in the 2d culture the plates are coated with the ecm okay. similarly here we are providing the ecm in a artificial manner again 
when you are uh, making the polymers uh, let's say you can see you have this polymer mold you have the polymer plus solvent or any chemical so it will polymerize and once it polymerizes it will form the it will go this is a molded polymer next time you do the experiment you use the similar uh, use the similar concentration of the polymer and the solvent okay. then you will not get the similar kind of pore formation here here you can get something like here, 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 you, here you can get something like here. So it is not, the results are not reproducible. This is the major advantage of this. Low reproducibility. ECM is artificial. Techniques are laborious, expensive, difficult to scale up, not compatible with high throughput. If you have thousands of drugs, it's difficult to test them in the scaffold based system, except the microfluidics. Then difficult to isolate and recover the cells from the structure and the further acid. You have the scaffold, your cells are embedded in between them. You have to isolate these cells. So that is a difficult process. Sometimes you require the specific equipment and the tools such as the 3D bioprinter. Gradient of gases, nutrients, pH is not always reproduced. So you have to be careful about when you are using the scaffold based system. Uh, do a proper research, which polymer to use, which method to use, which uh, solvent to use, and stuff like that. Or if you want to have a certain sort of equipment for that. So you have to be very careful. Basically, the scaffold system are using for the tissue engineering purposes, as I said before, where they can be used as the delivery vehicles for the cells and drugs and should meet the needs for regeneration and repair. As I said before, you have the scaffold you have the drugs in this, you are incorporating this um, scaffold, this is let's say scaffold, which is artificial scaffold, and this is the human body, and let's say this is the bone, and you are incorporating this scaffold here, you want these bone cells to repair, so they sh this scaffold should provide the mechanical strength, it should be biodegradable, means after the healing process it should degrade naturally, then uh, it should provide the molecules for the cell growth, proliferation and the vascularization and it should repair the body tissues with the minimum requirement. So here you can see repair body tissues with minimum requirement, cell growth, vascularization, proliferation, post integration. Finally, material should be degraded naturally during your after the healing process. So mainly the scaffold based systems are used for the tissue engineering. So there are many uh, techniques which are being used for the scaffold based system. We will go one by one. So like I said, for polymerization of the polymer, you have to use a certain sort of solvent. There are uh, methods where solvents are not being used, but uh, in most of the cases, you have to use certain chemicals in which the polymer is going to polymerize. So let's say if this is the poly L lactic acid or poly L coke like acid. This is the polymer, which is the artificial polymer. So you require a solvent in this. Dissolve this uh, polymer in the solvent, put it in the molded structure. As you can see, this is the rectangular mold, and this mold has the pore. So porogens are the substances that provide the that help in the formation of pores. So once you are adding this mixture, this mold then the solvent will evaporate after some time and then you will put this mold in the excess of water so the salt will leach up like the way if there is a crop if you have too much of salt in the soil if you want to dilute your soil or remove the so excess of salt from the soil you have to add water so the water is going to be leaches out similarly the salt is going to be leaches out from this when you are putting this mold in the water and Instead of this porogen, you will get the pore. So this is the solvent casting of particle leaching method. And you will get the fold like this, a scaffold in which there are the pores. So now your cells will grow in between these pores. And through these pores, they are going to interconnect with each other. 
so it's a widespread use of very toxic solvents sometimes the solvents are very toxic as i said before high end control porosity insufficient mechanical integrity salt or solvents can be present in the skin like i i have written here evaporation of the solvent but there are chances that the solvent is not being evaporated 100% or the salt if we are putting this mold in the water there are chances that there is not 100% salt leach so what will happen there will be presence of solvent in the solvent like a similar way we have uh, if we have a soil that has a uh, lot of salt in this and we have water the so salt is going to leach us at for the soil similar way then there is a one more method which is a gas cooling method in which the organic solvents are not being used so what happened you have a molded biodegradable polymer let's say the polylactic co glycolic acid and you put this molded biodegradable polymer in the chamber which is having a high pressure of co that the atmospheric pressure so this process will require at least 72 hours at 5.5 megapascal so the so gases are pressurized at very high pressure with the gas forming agents such as co2 nitrogen water or chlorophyll so you have a polymer you put it in the chamber that has uh, excess of co2 so that way you are creating a very high pressure of the co2 and then you are reducing the pressure to that atmospheric level so what will happen at a high pressure this uh, co2 gas this, this is going to be soluble but, but once you are reducing the pressure the solubility of the co2 will decrease okay and that will evaporate then from the smoke and then you will get a uh, something like this the pores so what we are doing we are having the polymer solution we kept it in the high pressurized co2 chamber where the pressure of CO2 is very high. So CO2 will dissolve in this. And when, once you are reducing the pressure to the atmospheric level, the solubility of the CO2 is going to decrease. What I am saying is solubility, which is very high here. It will decrease here. When POC2 is equal to Okay. and then there is formation of the pores and once the pores grow that is called the growth of the gas bubbles and the size of the pores range from the rocket to the 5 minute micro polymer so the advantage is the organic solvent free process the disadvantage is the largely unconnected pore and the non porous external surface sometimes the external surface of this pore or your polymer is not having that So it is not cold. So this is the disadvantage. There are many techniques based on this gas uh, forming method. As you can see, in the gas forming sometimes is combined with the salt leaching, the polymers you can use for the PCL, PLG, and PLA pore size. So if you will do the literature search, you will find if you like if you want to grow yourself. and you uh, you want a pore size of 10 to 90 micromolar you can use pa pca Sim similarly uh, you can design your experiment in a way that you want then it comes to the freeze drying method the freeze drying method what will you do you have a polymer solution in the solvent you have you need to decrease the temperature so that it is going to freeze yeah, the solvent will freeze your polymer then what will you do you then we have to understand the phenomena of the sublimation what happened in case of the sublimation well this is the triple point below this triple point what happened the solid will directly convert into the yes there is no intermediate phase of the liquid so what so the pressure is less so similarly the same thing we have to do solvent we have we want to remove it so that the pores are going to be created and for doing that we can remove it by applying a pressure lower than the equilibrium paper pressure of the frozen solvent like below the critical point the pressure should be below the critical point below the triple point of the 
frozen solvent then it will sublimate and it will directly convert into the gas now you have the polymer that is having the interconnected porous micro structure is there Let's take the advantage. So advantage is this: it does not require use of a solid corrosion. We are not using any kind of corrosion, and the pore size is controllable, as I said before, either by controlling the concentration of the polymer, or by the solvent, or by the freezing method which we are using. You can control the pore size. This advantage is this: again, we are using the solvents, small pore size, porosity is irregular, and the processing time is long. So, what we have done, we have the polymer, we have the solvent, and then we have freeze it. Then the polymer will uh, freeze, and the solvent will also freeze. So formation of the solvent crystallization. Now we want to remove this solvent by doing the sublimation. And how we can do that? We have to apply pressure less than the vapor pressure on the solvent, so that this solvent will evaporate, and you will get the pores in. Here you can see. Here you can see. In the pore, these things will grow and connect with each other. So, in this 2020, this article has been published based on this freeze-dried method, in which they have used two polymers, and the solvent they use for the borax or the boric acid for the cross-linking of the polymers. And they said, if they are using the bore and nano sheet. The cell viability of the I mean the osteogenic differentiation is pretty much high in comparison to the standard technique. So they have published this in the BioImpacts 2020. So you can see here. Now this is the electro spinning method. What happened in this electro spinning method? You need a syringe pump that contains the polymeric solution. You have a high voltage source and you have a collector. So when you are applying a very high voltage source, what happened? Whenever the strength of the electric field exceeds the surface tension of the droplet that is coming out of this, when you will pump it, the droplet will come out. Whenever this voltage is pretty much higher than the surface tension of this droplet, then what happened? That, that the jet like the structure is going to be formed, and that is an extent. So, in most of the times, the nanoporous steps are formed by using this electro spinning method. Nanoporous means they have the pore size of the nanomoles. Again, you have to see the following uh, parameters are important the polymer solution, the viscosity, the molecular weight, the conductivity, surface tension, processing parameters like the distance, voltage distance between the tip and the collector, environmental parameters, everything is necessary when, uh, if you want to make a nanoporous system, you have to consider all these points. Advantage of this uh, nanopore and nanofibrous system holds these are two nanopolar to several micrometers from the tissue in the Homogeneous mixture made up of fibers with high tensile strength and larger surface areas to adjust protein than microchannels, presenting more binding sites to cell membrane receptors. Surface area is very Require use of organic solvent process depends on many variables. As I said, before. so many things the process. I hope you understood the main point is the narrow fibers scaffolds for the engineering homogeneous mixture and the tensile with the high high mechanical integrity they are going to provide high tensile strength. Then there is a method of phase separation in the basically it is used for the thermoplastic uh, material, the, uh, the material that uh, becomes softer when heated and harder when it becomes we are using this powder, we dissolve it at very high temperature and then we cool it down. So you will get something like this. There, there is the phase separation. The upper phase there will be polymer. Like this phase you can see the transparent one. This is the polymer free. So you can see this is polymer free phase. 
and this phase is polymer rich phase okay. and then you can remove it by pipette or something and then if you will dry it you will get a scaffold like this low temperature can be utilized for the integration of the bioactive molecule so what you can do when you are decreasing the temperature you can decrease the temperature so that you will get something like surface solution okay. and at that time you can add some sort of molecules whatever you want to add and then you uh, again you if you will cool it down you will get the polymer rich in the polymer free phase and then you have the molecules integrated in between this uh, scaffold porosity is uh, more than 98 percent the higher surface to volume ratio construct is the porosity is very high only used for the thermoplastic means the material will become softer when heated and harder when become cool so here you can see they have used for the bone tissue engineering so majorly they are used for the tissue engineering you have to be uh, very careful and i just want you to understand that majorly the scaffold based pd systems are being used for the tissue engineering they are very expensive this is very important tag which i want to describe it let's say if suppose a patient comes to the doctor and the doctor advises them to do the ct scan or the mri scan okay let's say the person heart is not working so then what the doctor will do doctor will uh, take the picture of the ct scan or the mri because they have the x ray like uh, report what they will do they will convert they will create a 3d design based on the ct scan and the mri scan and how they can do that by using the software which is a computer aided design software so when you are ordering the 3d printer that will comes that will come with the cad software this cad software will create a 3d design of the patient heart or the lung or the leg something like that then you have to download that 3d design in the stl file like you are downloading the file uh, in the pdf form in the word form or in the powerpoint or in the excel form. similarly you will download that file in the stl form and why because it store the form information about your 3d object then by using certain software like this bc and 3d cura you can cut or there are many other softwares I myself am not aware of many software, but by using certain software, you can convert the STL file to the G code file. But G code file will tell the computer, will tell this printer how to print the material. Okay. So first of all, you have to create a 3D design based on the CT scan and the MRI scan. Download it in the form of STL file. Convert that STL file into the G code file. So once you are or ordering this 3d bioprint is a very costly i don't know how many crores it is how many million dollars it is so when you are purchasing any 3d bioprinter that will be having everything so you need not to worry about it so that software will itself convert the stl file to the g-code file and g-code file will tell the printer okay in this way you have to print the material and now you have to provide the material what is going to be your material your material is going to be the patient cells as well as the uh, fibers that you have to provide so that is called the bio ink so now you will uh, add the bio ink in the cartridge so what you are going to do let's see here this is your bio ink in which you will add, add the cells and the material whatever if it is collagen or artificial polymers whatever and then you will put this bio ink in this 3d bio printer in which you have already done the pre bio printing pre processing you have done it okay so now this printer has all the information how to print these cells that will take these cells and will print it something like if you are typing on the word uh, like i type on the word file abc if i give the control uh, p command it will type abc Similarly, I have given the command to the computer already. Where? How come? Here. So here I have already provided the command. And here we are providing the cells. Which is, this is you can say the bio. -ink. We are providing the bio. -ink. We have the command, and now that will print it. Okay. Now it is it is going to form heart or. Uh, Let's say heart is like this, something, something like this, heart or lung or whatever, kidney. 
whatever you want to say. So now you can put it in the post processing as uh, as well for the differentiation. Uh, you can use many methods like you can put these cells in the bioreactors and while you are doing so for the better survival, rapid maturation, masculinization or any other issues what you are you want to then you will it and then it is ready to do. You can use artificial limbs, cosmetics, or something pharmaceuticals. So, in this way, you can get the artificial heart or artificial lung or artificial limb on your in your lab. You can see that. So, what you have done, you have provided the bio ink, which is the cells and the material to the printer. And the printer has already come out. I have to print a heart. I have to print a uh, whatever the thing. Okay. So, like, if I want to print ABC, this ABC is our heart or lung or limb or whatever. But to print this, this printer needs the ink, and we are providing the ink. And what is this ink? Ink is the cells and the material. So, this ABC, what I have written there in the word, is basically is what is the uh, heart or lung, whatever you want to print. Like ABC, I want to print, I will give the command. It will print out ABC. If I want heart to come out here, I will give uh, the heart 3D structure here. So it will, if I put the command control P or in the computer, but in this 3D where printer, the command is going to be different. When you will give the command and you will provide the ink, the ink will come in the form of heart. So let's say this is heart. And we have provided the bio ink, then this printer will come out with the heart. Okay, because our command is ABC. Our command is we want to print heart. How we come out come out of it? By doing the CT scan. The CT scan or MRI scan will convert the STL file to the G code file. You have to use certain software and if you are purchasing the 3D bio printer, you will get all these software in that very costly so these 3d printers use many kinds of tags like the stereo lithography so what happened this is the uv curable resin the resin that hardens on contact with laser so what happened the laser will fall out this is a mirror it will deflect here and then it will form the uh, so this is the UV curable resin, so it will become harder. Now we will move this platform down, and similarly we form the uh, resin. The resin will become harder here, and then become harder here, and then become harder again, and we get a scan. So what we are doing it, you need to understand. This is the resin tank. Here is a platform which is movable. Here you can see this is the movable platform. This is the resin, UV curable resin, so it's hard. So the laser, if there is a laser will fall on this resin, it will become hard. And once it becomes hard, you will just drop down this platform. And again, the laser will fall, again, it will, uh, it will become hard. So here you can get the scan. So there are many systems, as you can see, the laser scopes, XY scanning mirror. It will point the laser to the resin only, then the tank, then the UV curable resin, the cured part, the build platform, the build platform, this one, and the elevator. This is the platform, build platform, this is the elevator. Okay, so high resolution requires large amount of material, long processing can decrease the cell viability. So let's say if you are printing your uh, this part in your by using a 3D printer and since you are providing the cells and if the printer is going to take like two days or three days the cells may die. This is the disadvantage. Similarly you can use the selective laser centering in this again the same uh, concept is there that there is a laser source, laser beam, it will fall on the resin and the raise the pouch the resin will fall in okay? It will become hard. And once it becomes hard, this whole thing will come down because of the heavy weight. Now, 
in the other the tank there is a powdery delivery crystal pow powder delivery this is again the powder and paint bag so here the lab labeling roller will roll this material here so what i want to say is here uh here you can see if there is a two if the and there is a two uh tank in this there is a powder bag the resin if that is fall on this powder wet it will become hard and once it will become hard this will go down because of heavy weight you will get something like uh, say let's say this one okay. you will get something like hard here and it will come down to so here there is a gap now there is a another platform that has the same powder bag and the roller now the roller will move down this polymer system it's not coming Let let's say if this is your uh, system, and this is your resin, and once it is hardened, then this resin will come here, and there will be a gap up, up, up at the up portion of this part. Now this gap is going to be filled by this tank. That's what I mean to say, the roller will move it through the uh, powder bag to here where the space is there. you have to understand this there are two tanks both of the tanks are having the fibers or the powder bag in this tank when the laser will follow this the powder bag will fall in right and because of this heavy weight this will come down because of this piston and heavy weight now because since there is a uh, free space this free space is going to be filled by this labeling roller that will roll this powder bag on to this and again the laser will fall on this powder bed and again it will polymerize and again it will move down so this is selective laser sintering uh heat generated by the laser is not compatible with the cells is uh, capable of making complex structure in better bonding between each printed layer so there are in the market there are so many types of 3d bioprinters some may be using this tech some may use this tech so based on your uh, experiment you have to understand what the printer you want to purchase and why similarly some of the 3d printers use the fused deposition modeling in this you can see there is a build material tool is there and the support material is tool is there but again they are passing to the heating element this is the major disadvantage of material must exhibit a molten phase okay? and the heat used to melt the material is not compatible with cells difficult to make the complex geometry however it is a highly porous structure so something like this you are going to get out of this fused deposition model but i think this one is better because you can generate the complex material and the purpose of a beauty by now as we have studied about the scaffold based method now we are going to be are going to study the scaffold free method in which the cells are forming their ecm all by themselves we are not providing the ecm in the artificial bed so that is the scaffold free method as you can see here is promote the spheroid formation by avoiding the cell adhesion to the surface and favoring the cell to cell interaction cells self aggregation so you are providing the environment in which the cells can not attach to the surface and we are going to study which tech we are going to use but so the cells since the cells are not going to attach to the surface they are going to interact with each other and they are forming the Or the circles. No exogenous artificial platforms are used for bonding cell growth. 
like in the 3D bioprinter, we are using the 3D bioprinter. Uh, other methods also, we are using certain stones. We are not using it. We are not providing any kind of stones. We are just avoiding the contact of cells with the surface. These methods promote the formation of 3D micro tissues at cellular aggregates known as the spheroids or the multicellular tumor spheroids in which the cells produce their own PC. The main point of this. So, no external biomaterials are required. ECM is produced by the cells. High number of cell ECM interactions are established. High number of cell to cell interactions are established. Radiants of gases, nutrients, pH, and nutrients. Spheroids can be formed without any specific equipment or tools. They are high proportion mathematical models for the applied. So, I would say one of the major advantages of this is this that we are not supplying any artificial ECM, number one. Number two, high throughput assay could be developed out of it. Number three, high number of cell to cell or cell to ECM interactions could be established by using this scaffold free method. And we are not requiring any external biomaterials. The disadvantage, as I said uh, before, optimization may be required for the formation of uniform spheroid. So once you are forming the spheroid, and if, uh, let's say after 10 days you do a good experiment, there are chances that the spheroid size may differ. Spheroids may be destroyed during analysis and the manipulation, and only the few protocols and the assays are standardized. If you want to do imaging of a sphere, it is difficult. There are many methods. One of the methods is the education based method, in which you are completely agitate, ag agitating the cells so they cannot adhere to the surface, like by using the gyratrix shaker, roller tubes. Or NASA bioreactor. So you are continuously stirring the cells, so cells are not uh, adhering to the surface. The advantage is simple mass production of spheroids, long term culture. It is possible to control the nutrient and gases exchange, easy access to the spheroids. So if you are growing, uh, if you are putting any flask here, you can control the nutrients. These advantages are no uh, individual compartment for each spheroid. When you are going, let's say, there are the flask, so you will get a spheroid like this. This is the flask, you will get a spheroid here, 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 but not individual compartment. The spheroid size and shape is difficult to control. High shear stress not compatible with the size of the system. Similarly, in case of the hanging drop method, what you are going to do, you are going to have a cover slip, you will put a drop of a cell here, put a jelly here, and then you will just invert that cover slip onto your slide. So this is the hanging drop method. Here, the drop of your cell is hanging now, and now it will form the Once it will grow, it will form the Again, it is simple, low cost, and all these things, a disadvantage is laborious, non stable, hard to scale up, hard to perform, drug screening, not compatible with high throughput. Liquid overlay again, it is a technique that includes the formation of the spheroid by seeding the cells on the top of non adhesive surface. Uh, simple, low cost, no specialized equipment required, individual compartment for each spheroid is possible. Compatible with high throughput. And again, the uh, disadvantage is this optimization is needed to obtain a spheroid to uniform size and shape. Plate preparation procedure can be So, basic is this only. Whatever the way you are using, you are just avoiding the uh, adherence of the cells to the surface. Either you are using the cover slip, there also you are avoiding the adherence of the cell to the surface. That it will form the spheroid. Here also, you are doing the same thing because you are continuously agitating them or they are continuously stirring them, they will not adhere to the surface. So, here you can see in the spheroids, you can see the outermost cells are allopic cells and the innermost cells are hypoxic cells. They are having less oxygen. This 
there is a less oxygen the cells are acidic here the environment is acidic here because the absence of glucose will not convert will not go to the krebs cycle it will go to the it will directly convert to the lactic acid which is acidic in nature so the inner side of the spheroid is a Uh, is going to be acid acidic however outer side is not going to be acidic and what happened if the innermost layer is going to be acidic because of this acidity this is going to impact this is going to impact the drugs efficiency by affecting their cellular uptake the cellular uptake of the drugs may be reduced because of this acidity Cell cycle arrest. The cells here, they are going to be in the quiescent phase. But however, they are in the quiescent phase. They are going to be resistant either by producing cytokines or growth factors or some uh, proteins. They are going to show the resistance towards your drug. Ketogenic cell or constitution means you can make the steroid by using co-culture. You can co-culture these cells with uh, cancer stem cells. Let's say. Or fibroblast cells, you can co-culture them, and then you can get the ketogenic cell or constitution by the steroid method. Cell-to-cell -cell physical interaction due to tight and air junction. Cell-to-ECM interaction, and there is a physical barrier that limits the mass transport. That is in the case of the in vivo, and therefore these cells are quite uh, showing resistance to the drug. Therefore, the uh, the three D culture now is in high demand because in vivo also cells are showing resistance, and we want to have a resistance model. So, this is all about it. I have seen somewhere there is one platform uh, called the Xtix platform, and that platform uses the scaffold based system. Means they are using certain fibers. Uh, I don't know which fibers they are using. But then they are having the platform, and on that platform they are growing the cells. I don't know which method they are using, but that is uh, also uh, they are claiming that uh, the downstream processing, like the Eliza, they can do uh, Western blood broadcast. They can do by using that platform. So you can maybe study about that as well on their website. So in our next lecture we are going to study the antibody lab. Thank you.